Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Sarah Kendrew. I work on the um, ESA James Webb team uh, in, in Baltimore. And I'll be talking about the, sorry? Pointing. Yeah. So I'll be talking about the uh, low resolution spectroscopy mode uh, with MIRI. Um, just an, an overview. So I'll just show a little bit the uh, design and operating principles of the uh, MIRI low resolution um, spectrometer. Um, show the sort of how the focal plane is laid out, where it features. Um, I give an overview of some of the, the testing and the data that we've had that from which we've learned uh, about the performance of the mode. Um, give a bit of information about how to prepare for observations and comparing and contrasting the slit and slitless uh, operation of the mode. I'll show some performance um, metrics and summarize with the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the mode. Um, I've just listed some further references there. Uh, last year we had a MIRI volume in, in the journal PASP, and so there's a number of papers there that are relevant to this. The one on LRS, but also relevant are the imager, um, Alistair Glass's work on the sensitivity, and Carl Gordon led a paper there on the operations, and these are all very relevant and capture a lot of the knowledge that we have on, uh, on the instrument. So the basics of the uh, LRS. Basically, the low resolution uh, spectrometer forms part of the imager module. Um, so, it shares a focal plane, as you can see there, and you've seen this in um, some of the other MIRI talks. And in that sense, also, uh, Alistair's talk this morning on the imager, uh, a lot of that information is very relevant to what I'm presenting here because basically this is part of the same uh, module of uh, MIRI. So, the LRS provides uh, are of, of around 100 uh, spectroscopy of um, optimized for compact sources uh, from 5 to 12 microns. So the nominal design range was 5 to 10 microns, but based on our experience with the instrument, we, uh, we uh, give the, the, the range uh, as 5 to 12 microns. Um, the spectral resolving power does vary over this range from around 40 uh, to about 160 over the 5 to 10 micron, uh, 5 to 10 micron range. Uh, the LRS can be operated either with the slit and uh, with slit dimensions of you know, around 4.7 by um, 0.5 arc seconds uh, or in slitless mode. Uh, as I mentioned, it shares the focal plane uh, with the imager and the coronagraph mode, so you can see the, uh, the layout of the, um, the imager focal plane where I've shown the locations of the slit and slit spectroscopy region and slitless, uh, the slitless region, and I'll show that in a bit more detail um, in the next slides. The spectral dispersion is achieved by, uh, with a, by a double prism, which is mounted in the imager filter wheel. Um, and I've shown there the kind of as-designed um, dispersion profile, so showing uh, pixels versus, versus microns. Um, and a feature that you can see there is that basically the dispersion profile uh, turns over around about four and a half microns. Um, to mitigate that, on the, there is a um, mask a filter kind of fitted onto the uh, slit mask that blocks all the radiation shortward of four and a half microns in slit mode. <coughs> um, so for slitless operation, uh, we don't have that filter. So that feature, although the, uh, the throughput does cut off there quite sharply, but that feature is basically present in the slitless operation. So here you can see uh, the focal plane a little larger. I'll start with the slit spectroscopy. So you can see the location of the slit here. Uh, and then this and the prism disperses the spectrum uh, in this region here. So with the, with the wavelength increasing downwards. Um, when operating in slip mode, we read out the entire, uh, focal p the entire array, so there is no subarray for uh, the LRS slip mode. Um, important is that the, the, the rest of the field of view is not blocked when we perform LRS slit spectroscopy. So any sources that are in this portion of the field of view will also be dispersed and so will also be uh, in, in the raw data. Um, we have a dedicated target acquisition region defined here. So uh, from the, the, the target can be placed here with an imaging filter and then from this location 
uh, after the centroiding algorithm is, is applied, you can then jump to the slit center location with very high precision um, uh, to, and then perform the spectroscopy. For slitless spectroscopy, uh, the, there is a fixed pointing position defined for slitless spectroscopy. And we have a, a, a subarray on the detector also uh, defined that is read out. So because we have a small subarray read out here, we can, this can be read out much faster, which allows the um, observation of brighter targets than we can do with the, uh, with the slip mode. Um, also, because there is no slit, basically, you don't have any kind of throughput variations, which makes this a, uh, a, a more suitable way of performing these transit observations, as we've heard also from the other instruments. Here's just showing some uh, some data that from the from some of the early test campaigns that we performed. So you can just see here kind of this uh, this focal plane with the spectrum here in the location that I showed in the previous slide. So this is a slit spectrum. This is a, um, a spectrum of a similar source in slitless mode. So you can see they basically look um, pretty similar. Uh, this is just read out on a smaller region. Uh, and then extracted and wavelength calibrated, you know, these are just with some of the test filters that we were using during the uh, early test campaigns uh, for MIRI. So all the knowledge that we have, or a lot of the knowledge that we have uh, on the uh, operation and performance of LRS comes from a history of test campaigns for the instrument. Uh, other speakers on MIRI have already uh, gone through this as well. Uh, as the LRS is part of the imager, we uh, were also able to test this mode in the um, imager test campaign, which was uh, in Paris in at, at CEA, and that goes all the way back to sort of 2009, 2010. Um, we then had our um, flight test campaign in Europe at the Rutherford Appleton Labs, that was in 2011. And then we've had further subsequent cam uh, campaigns at Goddard in, in recent years that many of you have participated in. Uh, and also mention the JPL a detector test campaign. So these are not specific for LRS. We don't have a dispersive element there, but we've learned an awful lot about the detectors, uh, which is all very important for LRS as well. Um, as particularly kind of referring to Alistair and Dan Dickens' talks from earlier, um, see, since these test campaigns, we've learned an awful lot and done a lot more modeling um, on the sensitivity, detector effects, um, uh, or PSF modeling, et cetera, et cetera. So we've learned an awful lot and have been able to kind of update uh, what we know from these uh, early test campaigns. So this is kind of where we've been able to gather a lot of knowledge about this mode of the instrument. Now, just to go through uh, things to consider when preparing an observation. So beginning with slip mode. Um, <coughs> user can define uh, whether you uh, is observing a point or an extended source. So there is, if we're in slip mode, there is support for both these uh, modes. Um, and the, uh, so if, if a, with for a point source, or oh, I've did the ring later on, yep. So uh, the target for target acquisition, as I mentioned, we have a dedicated uh, target acquisition region. Um, for this target acquisition, there is a choice of four imaging filters uh, we can use. So there's a filters at I think five, 11, 15 microns, and then also a neutral density filter. Um, the dithering strategies, uh, so for, for, points, for a simple point source, the um, dithering strategy is to just have two, uh, pos two nod positions along, this, along the length of the slit. Um, and then the, um, the um, regions of and the this these pointings themselves can be basically used for background subtraction, so you don't need to do dedicated um, background pointings. For an extended source, uh, you can define an, an off-source background um, observation that can then be used for background, ex for, uh, background subtraction. Um, for LRS also, there is the choice of uh, reading the detector out in fast or slow mode. If we compare that then with slitless, observations. So uh, slitless observations will also, if, if this is selected in APT, if you select slitless observations, this will automatically assume you're doing time series observations. So this will then automatically uh, switch some, some parameters and will 
flag these data as time series and, and will then also go to this dedicated uh, branch of the pipeline, which I think Carl will be talking about uh, later and which Tom also mentioned <coughs> just before. Um, so for Slitless, we, we have a dedicated subarray, dedicated branch of the pipeline. Um, the target acquisition procedure is something that we're actually currently uh, still defining, but uh, we will not be, have, will not be using most likely a, 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 a different subarray for target acquisition. We will most likely just be doing the target acquisition from within the slitless uh, subarray itself. Uh, and again, with using the um, using a one of a number of uh, filters, uh, but given that the majority of slitless observations will be on very bright targets, uh, it's most likely that I think that the neutral density filter will be uh, used for that. Um, there's no dithering for these uh, transit observations, for these time series observations. Um, so that option uh, is, is switched off for that mode. Um, and again, the, the maximum exposure time of 10,000 uh, seconds is waived for these um, observations as these transits um, will often be observed for much longer than that. The minimum frame read time <coughs> in fast mode for uh, the slitless subarray is uh, 0.17 seconds. So that's compared to approximately three seconds for fast mode in full array. So that gives a significant uh, improvement in the bright brightness limit of, uh, of, of LRS in slitless mode. And I'll show the numbers for that later on as well. So here's just a screenshot of the APT, the Astronomer's Proposal Tool. Um, when you select the um, MIRI low resolution spectroscopy mode here. So here, there are just the things you can choose. So here you, in the subarray field, that's where you select either full, which will it, it signifies the slip mode, or slitless, which will then, which is currently called subprism, but the nomenclature will probably be changed there. Um, which will uh, then take you to the um, slitless mode and TSO um, kind of template. Um, again, here in the dither options, if you're using the slip mode, so you, use full you select full under subarray, there you'll have the choice of point source or extended target. <coughs> and then here you can select slow mode or fast mode. The number of groups are uh, currently, there are, I think, a lot of uh, warnings about uh, if you select a number of groups that's less than four. But again, the minimum number of, of groups is something that's kind of under discussion. Um, so that's, that's probably likely to evolve uh, in the next few months. To show some sensitivity uh, plots here. These are from Alistair Glass's um, past, past paper on the MIRI sensitivity. Although these numbers have evolved. So uh, for example, this does not yet include um, this, uh, these revisions on the detector quantum yield that um, Alistair has talked about, which are likely to affect the sensitivity at, in the sort of five to six micron range. Um, but we haven't fully quite sort of computed how it's going to affect the sensitivities for LRS. So you have to keep that in mind when looking at these plots. The plots show the sensitivity for, <coughs> this is the line sensitivity, uh, for uh, slit mode, so full frame readouts. Um, and uh, in general, the, the rule of thumb is that for slitless observations, the sensitivity is a factor of around 10 worse than for slit. Here's the um, continuum sensitivity. Again, uh, for 10 sigma observations in 10,000 seconds with the same caveats. So this, there are some effects there uh, that we've learned about more recently, which are not yet included in there. So this, these are subject to being updated. Uh, interesting for the time series community, the, t the transit spectroscopy community are the bright limits. Um, <coughs> here we see the uh, bright limits for the slip mode, um, with you know assuming two fra full frame reads. So this is slip mode full frame reads, going up to 60% of full well capacity um, in fast mode, uh, and that gives a minimum uh, minimum value along that um, curve of around 63 millijanskis 
at five and a half microns, and that corresponds approximately to um, a K button magnitude of eight, assuming an M naught star. Um, for the slitless mode, which is most likely to be used for these kinds of obs for, for these kinds of observations, the bright limit is a factor of about 17 higher. So that takes you down to uh, an equivalent K magnitude of something like five and a half, which will allow you to observe, um, you know, a very high fraction of exoplanet host stars. Uh, some limitations or things that are still open questions for us. So we have this turnover in the dispersion profile. So uh, we still have to kind of look at uh, the the um, effect of that on the in terms of calibration for the slitless mode. Uh, the bright limits, well, it's just kind of um, part of the general issue that of, of further understanding the texture effects and how they affect the uh, sensitivity of the instrument. So that may also um, affect the bright limits. I think we definitely will uh, get a lot of new knowledge about that. And also the uh, achievable stability and precision for very short ramps for very bright targets. So these are things that we're all looking to get more information about from uh, from, from maybe from further testing and modeling and analysis. Uh, a lot of our, as in for, all, for a lot of the instruments really, is that uh, a lot of our calibration data is currently based on ground test data. And as I showed, some of that goes back uh, quite some time. Um, the testing in, the, the ground testing was very much focused on our nominal uh, range of observation of five to 10 microns. Um, so, Things that, so calibration, so things like wavelength calibration, etc., have a fairly a large uncertainty still outside of that range because we were not so focused on, on testing that initially. Um, things like the PSF model will still be improved. These are all basically things that will be uh, tested further during commissioning or calibration observations uh, very uh, um, early on. So we expect we'll be learning an awful lot still about the uh, operation of, um, and performance of this mode. So then just to summarize some strengths and weaknesses, um, just to uh, borrow uh, Alistair's terms here, so the LRS was built by the same heroes that built the Miri Imager. Um, and um, the mode, uh, again, as, the Im as with the Imager, kind of meets and exceeds the uh, initial requirements. For example, in wavelength coverage, we can certainly say with confidence that we can observe um, uh, beyond 10 microns out to 12 microns. Um, <coughs> with excellent performance. Um, I think the uh, LRS is a really good complement to, um, to MIRI's medium resolution spectrometer, but also to the near infrared spectroscopic modes. Uh, it provides sort of a, a very complementary spectral resolving power and gives a really nice instantaneous broad wavelength coverage, which is really important. If we can sort of uh, you know, match that up with the near infrared instruments to give a very broad kind of wavelength coverage for things like exoplanet transit observations. Um, again, the slitless mode is, you know, gives, it gives us the ability to perform very high quality time series observations, I think, um, you know, giving a much improved kind of bright, bright limit compared with the slit observation so that it makes it suitable for many exoplanet host stars. Weaknesses and caveats is that we have this unmitigated spectral fold over below four and a half microns which we don't fully understand the impact of yet, but um, <coughs> we're confident, you know, we're, we're confident that our performance will still be excellent, of course, um, and that we need, you know, we need more data basically to optimize our calibration, but that kind of goes for everybody really, so thanks. <laughs>